Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Minnesota Historical Society's History Center here in St. Paul. I'd like to welcome you all for coming and joining us for the, uh, tonight's program as part of the Harold C. Deutsch World War II Roundtable program. We have a very interesting program for you tonight, and we're glad that you've taken time to join us. So to begin, I'd like to introduce Mr. Don Patton. My, my commitment is to have veterans for all programs. Obviously, because of the COVID, we cannot uh, age and health uh, are, are an obstacle for us now. But I, I do want to, when it's, uh, when it's possible, to start having um, veterans on our panel as, as a part of each of our programs. Uh, I, I will just tell you, this is uh, a little bit of a commercial, but Belzer Automotive just made a, a very generous contribution to some of the software and hardware to enhance the, uh, I'll call it the primitive uh, recordings that we had in some of those uh, older days. Uh, I, I get the question, uh, we're, we're, we've actually got an itinerary for the trip next May, June to England. Uh, of course, Europe is on major shutdown with the COVID so we, we hope we can pull that off uh, as we uh, get into the spring. But uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for supporting the roundtable. And um, I, thanks to the Historical Society for their support of this. John and I planned this program a year and a half ago with this <coughs> new book that Axel introduced, Fire and Fortitude. Uh, this would have been John's, I think, fifth time here He's become such a great friend of our roundtable. Uh, when the COVID thing came, uh, in fact, I have a copy of his flight schedule. Uh, we had it all planned. And then the, the, uh, the, whether it be Missouri, University of, or the state, they, they forbid him to travel. John actually um, had volunteered. He was going to drive up yesterday get his, get his uh, feet on the ground today, drive back tomorrow, teach class on Thursday. But uh, that was then going to, to uh, actuate a two-week quarantine once he got back. So tonight we're, we're doing this on Zoom. So I want to introduce uh, John McManus as our uh, speaker on his book, Fire and Fortitude. And I want to congratulate him, and, and we will. John, congratulations on your award of the Gilder Lehrman uh, Award on Military History that uh, just uh, uh, was announced in the last week or so. But uh, John is a great historian, a great researcher. The, the topic of this book, I, I know for you Navy folks, you Marine folks, that think you won the war in the Pacific. <laughs> John, John McManus will talk about the great contributions of the U.S. Army as uh, they fought their way through the, from the uh, frozen uh, Aleutians up in Alaska to the terrible jungles down in, uh, in uh, uh, New Guinea. This is the first volume. I know it's only 700 and some odd pages. But uh, when I was talking to John, uh, volume two will be out in probably a year and a half or two, and that's probably going to be 800 pages. So uh, we'll, we'll, hopefully the COVID will be through, and we'll have, we'll have John back for his second volume. So John McManus, welcome to the roundtable, and uh, thank you for working with us on making this great presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I'd like to thank, uh, of course, Doug Rainey and the Minnesota Historical Society uh, for, for hosting everybody there tonight and facilitating this, this Zoom meeting that we're having. And of course, I'd like to thank my, my dear friend, my old friend, Colonel Don Patton, um, for, for all your support and kindness and, uh, and inviting me to, to, to do this tonight. Um, I'd like to thank everybody else for making time to, to, um, uh, to show up and, and also to, to listen tonight. And, you know, those of you who know me and have met me in the past when I've been there know how much that I, I really enjoy visiting. So I'm, you know, I, frankly disappointed I can't be there with you all tonight. And I apologize for that. 
but I, you know, as Don had mentioned, I'm looking forward to better days when I can come back to just one of my favorite places and, and some of my favorite people on earth. And I just really appreciate, um, every, all your support over so many years. Um, yeah, you certainly I'd like to discuss my book, Fire and Fortitude, and in that sense, the U.S. Army and the Pacific War, 1941 and 1943. And of course, you know, when you just glance at this map, you can just get a, a quick sense of the, the vast scope of this war. Um, it's a war that took place over about one third of the world's surface, so just an expansion of ocean and islands and continent. Uh, that was so vast that it, it uh, geographically really compelled the Army and the Navy to, to divide up uh, control of the theater, as you see Delaney in the map there. But also, I think, as, as many of us realize, it was a sort of political compromise between the Army and the Navy. Um, and so what compelled me to, to approach this topic uh, and to write this book and, and the other one that's in the offing, and, and Don's right, the other one is going to be even bigger because it's a bigger story, 1944 and 45. Um, what compelled me to, to take this really kind of enormous story on was my sense of a, a kind of popular perception, even among some very knowledgeable people, that um, the ground war in the Pacific was basically owned by the Marine Corps, that the Marines did the ground fighting, that the Navy did everything else in the war against Japan, and that the Army focused primarily on Europe. And um, that, is, that is absolutely incorrect. Um, I, I've had just really kind of stunning conversations with, with some folks um, who are very knowledgeable about World War II and who had kind of had that perception, really through no fault of their own. I think it was just sort of a kind of perception that had survived ever since the war. Uh, but in truth, 1.8 million um, American ground soldiers served in Asia or the Pacific in the course of World War II. And that does not include the Army Air Forces, which of course uh, would add to the total even more, but I'm not even counting that. Uh, so this army of 1.8 million was the third largest land force ever sent overseas by this country to fight a war behind only the European armies in World Wars I and II. And yet, you know, it seemed very anonymous historically for its size and, and I feel its importance. Um, it carried out the vast majority of the amphibious landings in the Pacific example, um, the Marine Corps carried out 15 amphibious landings in, in the entire war against Japan. Uh, Lieutenant General Robert Eichelberger's 8th Army alone carried out 35 in the spring of 1945 in the Philippines. Um, the Marine Corps was its largest size ever during World War II. It mobilized six divisions. Uh, the Army, though, had 21 divisions plus multiple regimental combat teams, tank battalions, engineer brigades that, that added really several more divisions worth of manpower. So I'm kind of speaking of tonight for uh, these guys, uh, the average Pacific Theater GI who really didn't have, I guess, what we'll say, you know, loosely is the good fortune, at least in posterity, uh, to fight on a rather famous uh, battlefield like Normandy or the Bulge or to receive so much post-war attention and so many accolades. Um, they, they fought in these sort of anonymous jungles and swamps. Um, and I would argue that they fought just as hard, if not harder, um, than, than anyone else in the war and perhaps in a, in a tougher environment. Um, so I think there's much we can learn from their experience. And I, I think that uh, the war they fought has shaped our world today every bit as much as the war in Europe, if not perhaps even more. And I, I also want to underscore, um, and you can see, <laughs> you can know the kind of conditions they dealt with, but I, I want to underscore my purpose tonight and in writing these books is not at all to denigrate uh, or belittle the United States Marine Corps, actually quite the opposite. Um, the, the, uh, the Marine Corps, when you get a sense of this larger context, as I hope that uh, Fire and Fortitude and the succeeding volume will give us a larger context of the, of the war, um, you get a sense of just um, what an incredible contribution the U.S. Marine Corps made to, to winning this war and the kind of sacrifices it made. Uh, I guess the term we would use nowadays is punching above its weight. Um, so, so the point of this is not at all to, to denigrate the Marine Corps or, or any other service, but perhaps just to, to kind of round out our contextual understanding and knowledge of, uh, of the war against Japan. And so, you know, it, um, from an historian's viewpoint, it was quite a, quite a nice sweet spot because it's a, it's a fairly uh, um, untrod topic. But one, of course, that you can imagine has just, you know, an enormously rich source material to, to, uh, uh, to serve as a guidepost. So 
Um, so the, the scope of this book begins with Pearl Harbor, kind of through the Army's eyes. Of course, the, the, the Navy was the main target for the, for the Japanese uh, when they attack on December 7, 1941, and everybody else is just kind of in the way. Uh, but for those soldiers who were in the way, obviously, there's uh, some, some pretty major fighting that goes on and a fascinating experience. So it begins at Pearl Harbor, and it ends with the, the, uh, the Battle of Macon, the invasion of Macon in November 1943, which happens in tandem with the much more famous invasion of Tarawa by the 2nd Marine Division. So um, in between, you just see this, um, this sort of growth of the Army from this provincial force to uh, what's becoming a massive and complex military force capable of carrying out uh, incredibly complicated modern operations. And of course, there are there are so many different themes and harbingers, um, you know, that that uh, that you'll see play out, especially the sort of uh, post-colonial future for Asia. Um, so many that uh, you know we could we could go on for hours about that. So you can imagine that, in addition to all the various battles, the issues, the personalities, uh, the various subjects that come up when you look at a, a topic of this kind of scope. Um, that you know it, it could go on forever. So uh, to get a full appreciation, obviously, my I would have to say you have to buy the book and read it. And obviously, that's always my terrible agenda. And I've signed books uh, uh, for that purpose for you to have. But of course, since it wouldn't be much fun for any of us tonight uh, if we all just sat here and read the book together, I'm just going to focus on a few sort of representative uh, stories that I think convey the gist of and feel of fire and fortitude, and I think of of this topic and this phase of the war. So. Let's start with uh, the great elephant in the room, uh, Douglas MacArthur, a man whose ego uh, on a good day might have fit into the Grand Canyon um, if we were fortunate. Um, the background on MacArthur, of course, um, he had uh, gone to West Point. He was the son of a general, uh, Lieutenant General Arthur MacArthur, a bona fide uh, hero from the Civil War, a Medal of Honor recipient from that war for the fighting on, on uh, Missionary Ridge in 1863. Um, and obviously the American commander in the Philippines during the Philippine-American War that happens in the wake of the Spanish-American War around the turn of the 19th, 20th century. Um, so that begins this sort of love affair between the MacArthur family and, uh, and the Philippines and its people. Um, when Douglas uh, graduates West Point in 1903, uh, one of his first postings is to the Philippines, and that's where he sort of inherits that, that love of the people from, from his father as well, and he then will have multiple tours of duty there. He more famously serves in World War I, um, ultimately as a, a temporarily a brigade commander, then chief of staff of the 42nd Division, the Rainbow Division, uh, is heavily decorated and uh, quite a courageous soldier. Um, he becomes uh, a very young chief of staff of the United States Army at age 50. And uh, so by the mid-1930s, you know, he's still only in his mid-50s, and he's really sort of nearing retirement. Um, and he's not all that popular with the Roosevelt administration because of his constant lobbying for uh, more military appropriations in the context of the Great Depression and the New Deal. So um, the Roosevelt administration is, is kind of happy to get him out of Washington, D.C., and it's at this point that an old friend of MacArthur's, uh, Manuel Kazan, who had become uh, the, the president of the new Commonwealth of the Philippines that was forming, invited MacArthur to the archipelago to basically create and stand up and train and prepare uh, a Filipino armed forces. Um, and he, so he seizes on this um, to, to go and, and do his part to create this new Philippines. What had happened is that uh, um, the, the Congress had passed what was called the Tidings McDuffie Act in 1934, basically promising independence to the Philippines in 1946. But in the meantime, it has this sort of halfway house uh, status in which it has its own um, its own National Assembly, it has its own president, it has some level of, uh, of um, autonomy, and it is beginning its sort of uh, germination of new nationhood, but it is still technically a, uh, a colony of the United States and you have American military forces there. So you've got a combination then of, of uh, Filipino soldiers and American soldiers. This army that MacArthur will ultimately lead at the beginning of World War II is um, unique in American history in that it is a sort of Phil American colonial army, almost in the British model, uh, of the majority of local manpower um, overseen and um, and mixed together with uh, with the mother country's manpower as well. So 
Um, so MacArthur spends the second half of the 1930s uh, trying to stand up this military force and train it, which was an enormous challenge. There isn't much money. Congress doesn't want to appropriate money for that. The Filipino people are ambivalent about uh, investing money into the armed forces. So there's a lot of political opposition to it. Uh, Manuel Kazan is cool to it at times. And there's just sort of um, kind of overwhelming uh, cultural and institutional um, structures that, that mitigate against an effective military force at that point. And what I mean is the archipelago is so diverse with so many different kinds of people, ethnicities, religious wise, uh, linguistically, that it's quite difficult to create cohesion that, that you need to create a good military force. So for example, um, let's say I'm an American advisor uh, to a Philippine infantry platoon. And um, you know this, this whole army structure that the Philippines have at this point is basically modeled after the US National Guard structure. Um, and let's say I'm overseeing that platoon, there, there may be six different languages represented in that same platoon. Um, and these guys may or may not speak English. They may or may not have weapons or enough food or whatever. So, uh, so MacArthur's position is quite, quite difficult. Um, and I, I, but I, but I would argue this, that, um, his errors make a, a bad situation worse. Um, for, for many, many years, uh, the war department in thinking of the possibility of war with Japan had prepared something called War Plan Orange. And it, it had a sort of bigger context, but what it means for the Philippines is that, you know, they're on the main island of Luzon, you can see Manila, Manila Bay, and then this is of course Batan over here, B-A-T-A-A-N. Um, what you're gonna do is you're gonna realize, well, the Japanese are, are just in the neighborhood and they have more naval power there. Um, so they're gonna get the drop on us. They're gonna get ashore. So what we'll do is we'll retreat to good defensible ground. We'll dig in and hold on there. We'll hold on to Manila Bay and Manila. And we'll wait for the United States uh, Navy's Pacific fleet to fight its way to us in a major fleet engagement uh, to defeat the Imperial Navy and then reinforce and resupply the archipelago. Um, so War Plan Orange basically presupposed that the Japanese, when they came to invade, when and if, that they would get ashore. Uh, when MacArthur uh, takes over, he discards War Plan Orange and he says, no, the Japanese aren't going to get ashore at all. Uh, we're going to stop them right at the waterline. So we're going to sprinkle our troops all around Luzon and some of the other islands, the coastal areas, and we will repulse them at the waterline. Um, and it's it's just a, it is an extremely difficult concept to to bring to fruition, and is not going to be successful. And I would argue um, that that uh, it, without digressing too much, that Erwin Rommel makes the same mistake um, in northern France. Um, you know, fighting a military force that's almost certain to get ashore, and then he's hamstrung in many ways from thereafter. Same deal with uh, with MacArthur. So uh, this was the first era. The second, of course, is when hostilities do commence. Um, in December 1941, uh, MacArthur loses the better part of about half of his um, air force, um, mostly on the ground. Uh, he knew that hostilities had commenced. Um, he had known about Pearl Harbor. Uh, he figured that a Japanese invasion would happen, and yet there was still just this sort of sort of comedy of errors that leads to this and takes out some of his heavy bombers, his B-17 bombers, um, that might well have interdicted some of the Japanese shipping that come that uh, that is going to come into play. Uh, so that, in tandem with weak naval forces, um, basically means that the Japanese are going to have more or less control of the air and the sea, which means they're almost certainly going to get ashore. Um, so this was just a, a a real debacle. So when the Japanese do invade in December of '41 with ground forces, now um, the plan to to uh, defend at the coastline falls apart. I mean, literally in minutes and in hours, it falls apart. Many of the, the sort of half-armed, ill-trained uh, Filipino forces just kind of melt away, uh, you know, just retreat from the coastline. And then you have others that fight very well. It's, it's a mixed bag. Uh, the Americans are confused. But um, I would argue that the, uh, the biggest sort of uh, consequence of this discarding of War Plan Orange is logistical. And the key to this entire campaign in 1941 and 42 is logistical. Okay, so here's how. Um, initially, War Plan Orange envisioned that the army would store most of its food there on Bataan. It makes sense. That's where you're fighting. And you just prepare to hold on for months and months and months at a time. And you buy yourself a lot of time then. 
but when MacArthur discards War Plan Orange, um, it means that the logistical stocks of the army are going to be sprinkled all over in depots all over Luzon. And thus, when the army retreats, uh, ultimately to Bataan, um, so, so MacArthur, to his credit, sort of re-embraces War Plan Orange rather than discarding it altogether, and he gets a lot of his army there. Um, but by that time, they're going to have to leave most of their, uh, their food and other supplies behind. Uh, there's examples. There's 10 million pounds of rice at Cabanatuan in central Luzon. Um, it's hard to take that with you all the way to Bataan, uh, but also uh, President Kadan had, uh, Kazan had forbade it, and MacArthur was not willing to overrule him. MacArthur would not even authorize the appropriation of thousands of cases of canned food from Japanese-owned warehouses in Manila. Um, so this is... Um, you know, a debacle waiting to happen. Um, his communiques and much of popular supposition ever since uh, will sort of embrace the, the myth that uh, the Allied forces were badly outnumbered and outgunned. Uh, in fact, the Allied forces outnumbered the Japanese by a factor of almost two to one. The Japanese themselves had serious disease problems, logistical problems of their own. Uh, what the advantage they did have, they controlled more or less the sea and the air. And this allowed them to set the tone and to reinforce and to eventually resupply. So by the time um, the remnants of MacArthur's army did get to Bataan, like early January 1942, um, their supply situation was hopeless. Uh, MacArthur's quartermaster, Brigadier General Charles Drake, estimated that they had the following on hand. 30 days of rations, 50 days of canned meat or fish, 40 days of canned milk, 30 days of flour, 30 days of canned beans and tomatoes and 20 days of rice. And so then you'd wonder, well, were there local food sources that might augment that? Not really. Um, the army was slaughtering 30 to 40 animals per day. Uh, so what that meant for you as a soldier, as a Filipino soldier or an American soldier, you had about six ounces of meat per day per man. Uh, Japanese air attacks put an end to fishing uh, expeditions off, off Bataan. And of course, the local population still had to eat too. Um, so if you're one of those soldiers, pretty soon you're on half rations and then quarter rations throughout those early months of 1942. Um, uh, so in spite of these problems, the, the army fought very hard. Uh, that army at Bataan is not really defeated tactically. It's defeated logistically. I mean, that really is the tipping point. The Japanese are going to have, have terrible um, uh, you know, small unit actions that don't work out well for them. They're going to try outflanking amphibious invasions at various portions of Bataan down here. Uh, that, you know, you have these little pockets of on Japanese enclaves that are just snuffed out, annihilated by uh, Allied troops. Um, it is, you know, a very difficult campaign for the Japanese. And, and one of the things that I think is really fascinating uh, about this book is I, I was able to, to really tell it from the Japanese point of view too, being one, especially from the soldier's point of view, because um, many Japanese soldiers kept diaries, um, you know, because they, they had not been trained or even, um, you know, allowed to, to even countenance the idea of surrender. And so the Japanese couldn't imagine that they would ever surrender or they would ever be in a position where they would, uh, where the allies would capture literary material from them. So uh, it was not forbidden to keep a diary. The soldiers kept extensive diaries, many of them, and many of them end up in allied hands and translated. And of course, then available for historians all these decades later. So one example I would give you is a, an Imperial Japanese army doctor who was in one of those perimeters I mentioned that got snuffed out. And, you know, he, you know, this, this unit he's with is suffering terrible losses. And he says uh, to his diary, I've made up on my mind. I will not have a disgraceful ending. Uh, I went back to my patients and told them it is better and more honorable to die with a pistol shot than to be captured. And right there, you see, of course, that Japanese tendency to last the rest of the war uh, to choose uh, to fight to the death or to commit suicide rather than become a POW. Um, the Japanese commander, General Hama, uh, sees his forces racked by disease and battle losses, and he has to ask them for reinforcements which led to a kind of humiliating loss of influence and face for him. Uh, but the Japanese, of course, were in a position where they could reinforce, unlike the Allies. Um, 
MacArthur is getting some very disingenuous communications from the War Department and, and, and even from Army Chief of Staff General George Marshall about the possibility of reinforcements. Uh, of course, this isn't a possibility at all, especially after the, the fleet is so crippled by Pearl Harbor. Um, so uh, he, he sends out a communique, uh, MacArthur does, to his troops who was hoping to be reinforced and resupplied. And he tells them thousands of troops and hundreds of planes are being dispatched. The exact time of arrival is unknown and they will have to fight their way through. It's imperative that our troops hold on until these reinforcements arrive. Well, of course, there was absolutely no truth to that. Um, uh, the general, where was he? He was on Corregidor. The communiques will make it seem like he's on the front lines of Bataan fighting alongside the troops. In fact, we've only been able to document one visit by, by MacArthur and Bataan. Uh, but Corregidor was in battle too. And of course, obviously, as I think most of you know, it's this um, fortified island right in the middle of Manila Bay. So if you want Manila, you've got to get Corregidor because it's a major entry point. So um, he's struggling, you know, under under the weight of this campaign, just like his soldiers. He loses 25 pounds in two and a half months. Uh, but he's got something else going on that no one under his command had. Um, he's got his wife with him and his toddler son. Uh, MacArthur had gotten married in the late 1930s uh, to Jean Faircloth. Uh, they had had a young son named Arthur. Uh, so he is all of four years old at this point. Um, and it, this is the fact that they're there is a little insight into MacArthur. Um, in May 1941, the War Department, knowing that war with Japan is highly likely, uh, had ordered all um, American military dependents out of the Philippines. And so everybody's family had left except MacArthur. And I think only my opinion, but I think historians have tended to overlook that aspect of MacArthur's management of this campaign, that the subplot to the whole thing, as, it, as you can imagine it would be, uh, is concern over his wife and son who are now exposed to Japanese bombs and shells on Corregidor. And uh, by the way, Jean comports herself with, with great courage too, just like her husband as well. Uh, but their presence must have had an effect on him. Um, and I think we might say all these decades later, their presence was highly inappropriate. Um, it also has an effect, obviously, on Washington policymakers who um, don't necessarily want to lose MacArthur to captivity, but also they're wondering what will happen. What will the Japanese do with Gene? What will they do with Arthur? Uh, these are difficult things. Um, so, uh, of course, FDR famously orders him out on February 22nd, 1942. Um, he will comply in early March, um, you know, taking his family and select members of his staff with him on a uh, clandestine escape aboard PT boats and eventually down to, to Mindanao down here where they'll catch B-17s to take them to Australia. Um, what, had, what had happened there too, um, that, that's sort of a background of the order, is that the, the, these communiques had created a kind of cult of personality around MacArthur. And of course, in the demoralizing early months of the war, the American people were really looking for any, uh, any hero, any kind of good news, anybody to rally around. And MacArthur sort of becomes that person. Um, certainly he's convenient for Washington uh, policymakers and propagandists to, to say, hey, we got this great hero fighting in the Philippines. And of course, MacArthur himself wants to cultivate that image of himself too. So there's this kind of cult of personality that sweeps through the country at that point. Uh, and so Roosevelt has decided it'd just be too devastating to morale uh, to lose him to captivity. Uh, he, of course, will then get a Medal of Honor, which is really more political than anything else, though, again, I want to emphasize he comported himself with, with uh, tremendous courage and honor uh, at Corregidor, but goes to Australia and famously says, I shall return, and uh, in that sense, you know, commits the Americans to eventually coming back to the Philippines. Um, Meanwhile, of course, the, the guy who's uh, who's left to deal with the, the rest of this mess in the Philippines is Lieutenant General Jonathan Wainwright, um, who, like MacArthur, had been born into the Army. He was the, the son of a cavalry officer, Wainwright was. Um, Wainwright's um, uncle was a, uh, was a, uh, a graduate of the United States Naval Academy, as was his grandfather. His grandfather was, I believe, in the first class to graduate from the Naval Academy in the 1840s. Um, so Wainwright had it came from a long and distinguished military tradition. He was tall and lanky, and uh, this was, of course, his great nickname in the army was Skinny. Um, so he uh, will command Allied forces from March onward, and he's at Corregidor, um, and of course uh, th these uh, these 
forces at uh, at both Batan and Corregidor are unfortunately doomed. So the forces on uh, on Batan will surrender on April 9th, 1942. Interesting little story about that. Um, it was Major General Edward Ned King who is going to have to surrender at Batan on April 9th, 1942. Um, he was a Georgian uh, who uh, who had um, who was from a Confederate lineage in the Civil War, had been grown up around stories of the Confederacy. Um, and yet, um, Ned King was an adamant opponent of uh, racial segregation and racism in general. And the first thing he would tell his officers um, and other soldiers, Americans who came to the Philippines, almost all of whom were white, is there's no such thing as racial superiority. Um, King, you know, leads this embattled force at Bataan, and unfortunately is doomed. Um, and, you know, the irony of ironies, when he has to surrender in April 1942, of course, that's almost exactly the anniversary of when Lee had to surrender to Grant at Appomattox in 1865. And so all King could think of was a sort of paraphrase of the, you know, the famous, uh, so I'll go to, 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 to General Grant and I would rather die a thousand deaths. Um, he will be consigned to three and a half, almost four years of captivity as a course for Wainwright. Uh, 21,000 Americans were captured in the archipelago in 1942 and about four times as many Filipinos. And that's the ratio of this army, uh, manpower wise. And by and large, the Japanese are gonna treat them with neglect, cruelty, even outright brutality. Um, so uh, I think a lot of ways, the best way to, to get an insight into the POW experience is through the eyes of this man. This is um, Harold Keith Johnson, who was a Lieutenant Colonel when he was captured on Bataan. You're seeing him later as, in life as a, as a general. Um, he was uh, United States Military Academy, class of 1933. Um, he had served what was called the Philippine Scouts. Um, Philippine Scouts were um, professional soldiers, Filipinos who joined the US Army as, um, as members directly of the US Army. Um, and they were very well trained. They were excellent soldiers and it was very, a very prestigious billet to have. So you had what was called the Philippine Division um, that is really MacArthur's most potent combat unit. And it had one regiment uh, entirely of US Army infantry soldiers. That's the 31st Infantry Regiment. And it had two regiments of Philippine Scouts, the 45th and the 57th. So that meant the majority of them are professional Filipino, Filipino professional soldiers with a leavening of American staff officers and, and NCOs and, and the like. Uh, so he was in the 57th Infantry and it functioned as an operations officer, as a battalion commander, de facto regimental commander. He'd done a lot of fighting. He'd done a lot of <clears throat> a lot of thinking and a lot of holding them together. And of course, then he ends up in captivity like so many thousands upon thousands of others. And he is, of course, quickly beset with the famous Bataan Death March, uh, one of many thousands. And he experiences privation, thirst, hunger, low morale, misery, neglect, chaos, sunning out treatments, exhaustion, uh, the whole thing. Um, he's married to, um, uh, his wife is named Dorothy and they had a, a very close relationship. He thought of her constantly. Um, and, you know, even in the midst of this terrible situation in which people are just dying left and right. Um, and a situation like that, I think we'd all agree would sometimes would often bring out the worst in all of us. Um, what was interesting about Johnson is the worst things got, um, the better it, it, better in nature, it brought out in him. Um, it brought out the best in him. To Johnson, ethics almost equated to life and survival. Um, leadership to him uh, meant selflessness. It meant professionalism. It did not mean glory. He didn't care a whit about glory. Uh, so as conditions grew worse on the death march and thereafter, he actually became more ethical, more concerned with others, and more spiritual, too, as they later put it. God was very close and very real in those hours. Um, the march claimed the lives of about 600 Americans and between five and 10,000 Filipinos. And uh, that, to me, is an important thing to, to sort of remember about the death march and thereafter, is the, the worst treatment really went to the Filipinos, not as much the Americans, though it was bad all the way around. Um, the survivors of the death march were consigned to what was called Camp O'Donnell uh, in central Luzon, uh, about 60 some odd miles away from, from the lower part of Bataan. And Camp O'Donnell was just a true hellhole. 
where conditions were even worse than in the death march in some ways. Uh, for over two months at O'Donnell, um, Allied soldiers died in droves, hundreds of them a day, from disease, thirst, starvation, even the occasional arbitrary beating or execution. You are the eternal enemies of Japan, Captain Yoshio Tsunoshi, the third-rate small-minded commandant, told the prisoners in an indu- introductory speech, what the prisoners called the, the GDU speech. I won't say the actual curse words. Um, and he, the, the commandant continued, and we will fight you and fight you and fight you for 100 years. Um, at O'Donnell, uh, in some ways, the biggest thing that was going to kill you was dehydration. Uh, it was very hot. There wasn't much water. You would spend all day in line waiting for a canteen of water and under that hot tropical sun. Um, You would eat rice gruel. um, And that was about it. It was chaos with little leadership. Initially, the Japanese were going to strip U.S. officers of all status and just throw everybody in there in this kind of lower to the flies environment. Um, And of course, it's just a chaotic uh, sort of predatory environment. Um, There the hospital had what was called the zero ward. And it basically meant you had zero chance of survival if you went there. Uh, men died awash in their own excreta. Um, I apologize for the, the vividness of that, but that's what happened. Um, one prisoner later reflected death was easier than life. It was as easy as letting go of a rope and a lot of people quit hanging on. Well, after surviving the death march, uh, Johnson fell prey to malnutrition and a terrible case of dysentery. Um, and he ended up in the Zero Ward. Uh, he was one of the very, very few to survive this hellish place. As he later put it, I don't know why. I just know that I came out. Many others are less fortunate. By the end of June, 1,547 Americans and between 21 and 26,000 Filipinos had died at Camp O'Donnell. Uh, the Americans, a one in six fatality ratio. Filipinos, about one in three. The survivors ended up at the Cabanatuan POW camp, uh, where the high death rates persisted throughout much of the summer and early fall until there was some level of better organization, a bit more food and medical care that helped stabilize the conditions into merely poor rather than overtly deadly. Uh, So Johnson plays a major role in this improvement after he gets out of the zero ward and is restored to some semblance of health. Um, You know, and this was at O'Donnell before he goes to Cabanatuan. And, And by the way, uh, the best book about Camp O'Donnell was written by someone who was there, Colonel John Olson, um, another guy who had served with the Philippine Scouts, and he he titled the book um, O'Donnell, Andersonville of the Pacific, after the infamous Civil War camp, uh, POW camp. And of course, I'd hasten to add, both sides in the in the Civil War treated their POWs abysmally, but Andersonville was probably the worst place. And, and indeed, O'Donnell was a lot like that. Um, so here's Johnson having survived O'Donnell. Uh, moving on to Cabanatuan, restored to some semblance of health. Uh, and he organizes an efficient, fair, and vital commissary system to procure food, medicine, and other stuff uh, from the outside world. He was unanimously chosen by his fellow prisoners for this job, a job that could mean life and death for, for many, many hundreds of people because of his impeccable honesty, because of his consideration for others. Uh, he made sure that there was a kind of joint collection of money and, and other tradable items uh, so that you wouldn't have just penniless people dying and richer people living so that they would pool the resources so that everybody could survive together. He was a student of human nature and he figured out how to work productively with the Japanese by ingratiating himself with them, building trust, but also, and I think this is such an interesting kind of delicious twist, deceiving them As honest as he was, he would deceive the Japanese in monthly audits, um, you know, all for the the, the greater well-being of the prisoners. He kept a fascinating diary that he wrote in the the form of of a kind of long letter to Dorothy. And he said, my commissary business is booming. Um, This was like early 1943. Uh, And indeed, the death rates had plummeted by then. Life stabilized and normalized. The prisoners were still hungry um, and underweight. They were prone to disease. Uh, but they were not dying in droves as much anymore. So it's fair to say uh, Johnson's ascent ultimately to chief of staff of the U.S. Army, which is what he was when you see this picture of him here as a four-star general, it begins in captivity. And you may notice, too, the two-time award of the Combat Infantry Badge, once for the Philippines and also later on uh, during the Korean War when he commanded uh, an infantry battalion and an infantry regiment. So uh, I think he's sort of the interesting face of the POWs. So 
Um, at the same time as all this is going on, obviously the the um, the Japanese have plunged into the South Pacific. You've had the the battles of uh, of uh, Coral Sea and Midway, and uh, New Guinea becomes sort of the focus of MacArthur's theater war. The Navy and the Army had divided up the theater. Uh, Chester Nimitz will control much of what you see here. This vast ocean, you know, and and uh, eventually an island hopping campaign. And MacArthur's um, theater is what's called the Southwest Pacific Area, or SWAPA. And obviously, as we know, MacArthur's great design is to get back to the Philippines someday. So to do that, you've got to have New Guinea. So MacArthur will uh, launch a counteroffensive um, from about uh, you know September 1942 onward. I won't call that the fall of 1942, because of course that's south of the equator and it would be the opposite, but uh, so I don't want to create confusion. But uh, um, this is what he's looking at in, in New Guinea here. Um, the key to New Guinea, of course, is Port Moresby. The Japanese had wanted Port Moresby because they would use it as a base perhaps to invade Northern Australia. Uh, so the Japanese had launched an overland expedition uh, like in uh, you know July 1942 with that purpose. Uh, but the, the terrain here in between the two coasts in Papua New Guinea is just beyond belief how horrible it is. Um, the Owen Stanley mountain range uh, with 10,000 foot peaks and the like, uh, no infrastructure, hardly any roads, a few tracks, heavy jungle, uh, overrun streams, uh, gorges, and uh, just a, a terrible disease ridden environment. And the Japanese had had to turn back. Um, so eventually that's what Coral Sea was about because then they thought they'd invade it by sea and obviously they're turned back at sea. Um, so MacArthur um, at this point has uh, Australians and US troops under his command and it's really the Australians in 1942 and 43 um, who take the lead and do a lot of the heavy lifting and fighting for the allies at that point in the war. Um, and Australia of course is the key base for the allies as they're gonna start to, to move north through the Pacific. Um, I would also hasten to add too that this fighting you see going on in Papua New Guinea, circa you know September, October, November, December 1942, is a kind of subplot of a larger story that's also taking place. Um, oops, back here, of course, at a more famous place called Guadalcanal. Now, as Americans, we tend to look at those as two different battles because they were under two different theater commands. Uh, but from a Japanese perspective, these were two uh, subplots to the same larger story of the South Pacific. And one of the reasons why the Japanese lose is because they're spread too thin at those two places at the same time. So what MacArthur is concerned about is that the Japanese will win at Guadalcanal and then begin to reinforce their already kind of formidable bases along New Guinea's north coast there. Um, and then make another push for Port Moresby. So that's why he so desperately wants to get to the north coast of New Guinea and capture these areas here you see, like Buna, Jerua, Gona. There's one that's not on the map called San Ananda that's very close. Okay, that's the key to this whole thing. And it's not going very well as of November 1942. Initially, um, he had sort of showed his, his a little bit of his ignorance as to what the terrain is like and how to operate there by attempting to send troops over land. Um, and this was a nightmare for these guys. Um, many of them were down with disease uh, or injured, um, you know, or just, just incapacitated by the, the environment. Whereas you could put troops aboard transport aircraft and get them to airfields here near Dobadura in about a 45 to one minute to one hour flight. So a world of difference there. So a, a game changer for MacArthur at this point in the war is when uh, Lieutenant General George Kenney will come to take over his air command, the Fifth Air Force, and begin to kind of school MacArthur on the, the importance of air power. Um, and so that's going to come into play in, in this campaign. So, so you see an Australian division, Australian 7th Division, and then you can see a U.S. division, what was known as the 32nd Infantry Division is initially going to be the only major ground combat force available to him uh, from the U.S. Army at this point. Um, and I, I think this is this is kind of humorous because it's so classically Army. Um, the 32nd Division, as I think many of you know, was a National Guard division from like Northern Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, from cold weather places. 
uh, and they were going to be earmarked for Europe, but naturally now they send them to the tropics, you know, so here's all these guys used to cold weather, not particularly hot summers, and now they're immersed in this tropical jungle environment, 95 degrees and humidity and just swamps, and it's, it's just a nightmare for them. Uh, so the, the disease problem is, is considerable. So MacArthur's worried, having already kind of lost the Philippines and been humiliated by that, he's worried he's going to be dealt another major defeat here, um, you know, by failing to get the New Guinea North Coast. And so he wants quick results. And when the 32nd is bogged down outside Buna, especially at the end of November 1942, he's going to turn to help. Uh, to, to this guy, Lieutenant General Robert Eichelberger, whom I briefly mentioned earlier tonight, um, whom MacArthur had known for a long time, um, a fellow West Pointer. Uh, Eichelberger was class of 1909. He had worked for MacArthur when MacArthur was chief of staff. Eichelberger was the son of a very prominent uh, Civil War veteran uh, from Ohio. And uh, Eichelberger's father was a successful lawyer and kind of gentleman farmer. And uh, Eichelberger was the youngest of five children and not taken very seriously. He was loved as the baby kind of thing, but not taken very seriously by everybody else and always had that kind of chip on his shoulder of, of trying to achieve in order to show that he was something and someone important. Um, and he was a sort of committed, honest military professional and warrior. He was, uh, a, so he, He's a classmate of George Patton, a very good friend of his, by the way. They both hankered for sort of um, enduring military fame and glory, but Eichelberger really didn't, uh, was not willing to pay it, be as ruthless as, as Patton was in that regard. But Eichelberger certainly prioritized that, but he had this incredible honest streak too. Um, and, and, a, and a kind of uh, very highly developed communication skills and an incredible courage about him too that, that we'll see. Um, so Eichelberger in World War I had, uh, had not served on the Western Front. He had served in what was called the Polar Bear Expedition, an Allied expedition to Siberia to squelch the Bolsheviks, uh, the Bolshevik regime. And he had seen combat there. He had been an intel officer there. He had gotten to know the Japanese there. Uh, and he was the kind of person who filed away those notes for future reference kind of thing. He was very intellectual in, in so many ways. Um, he was married uh, to Emma Gudger, who was from a kind of upper middle class background, um, and they were true soulmates. Very, very powerful bond. Uh, they had no kids, they had each other, and they had Bob's career. Uh, so um, MacArthur turns to Eichelberger and tells him to take Boone and famously says, take Boone a Bob or don't come back alive, you know, and all this business. And so uh, Eichelberger knows he's been given the assignment of his life. Um, before he left, he wrote to Emma. He said, you may be sure that I will always be with you in my thoughts. As I think of all the years we've been together, I know you must realize how my admiration, respect, and love have increased. All right, so here's what he's up against. You look at this a moment, you just see, man, this is a mess. He gets there on December 1st. And you can see what's happened here is you've got these this sort of collection point, little small unit actions. Um, and, and the map doesn't even begin to, to convey that most of this place is just a swamp, just a terrible swamp. And so you're restricted in your, your, um, your movement. Any air arena of movement, any trail, any dry ground is covered by coconut log reinforced pillboxes, uh, incredible fields of fire, all this kind of stuff. It's hard to move anywhere. The Americans have like almost no artillery, no real air support, no real naval support. It's a light infantry fight and it's a mess. Poor supply situation. He finds that the soldiers are hungry. Uh, they're not getting supplies to the front from the, the airstrip here up to the front of where guys are. They're demoralized. Um, they're racked with disease. The front lines are unstable. There's no patrols. There's inertia. There's lethargy. One officer described the troops as, quote, filthy, fever-ridden, practically starved, living in a tidal swamp. Um, Eichelberger, it was a very awkward situation because uh, his, an old friend of his and West Point classmate, Major General Forrest Harding was the commander of the 32nd Division. MacArthur had told him, relieve Harding. Uh, and Eichelberger was reluctant to do that and didn't want to, but ultimately decided he had to. And this created a rift between the two of them and really between their classmates that lasted the rest of their lives. Um, Eichelberger ordered a pause um, and an improvement of the supply situation uh, to where soldiers could actually eat. Um, 
reorganize things. He'd launch a major attack because he's got MacArthur breathing down his neck to snuff out the Japanese defenses there. The attack fails. Um, so uh, Sergeant Ernest Gerber, one of the soldiers in that attack, said about the Japanese positions, they're practically impenetrable to our fire. You could look right into one uh, and it looked like the jungle. And he's talking about their like pillboxes and whatnot. An operations report stated, our troops could not fight as units, but rather as individuals in twos and threes. And that's exactly it. So Eichelberger yielded to that reality and decided, you know what? I'm going to defeat the Japanese with like death by a thousand cuts rather than a big attack. So it just wears them down with these little small unit actions all over our map here as the weeks unfold. Um, and he's not just telling people to go forward. He's forward on the front lines almost all the time with a Thompson submachine gun or an M1 carbine, uh, just trying to goad people to move forward, leading them forward, risking his life. He comes close to being killed multiple times. He has aides who are hit uh, badly enough to be evacuated back to Australia. He loses 30 pounds in a month. Uh, and yet he finds time to write to Emma once or twice a day. Uh, it's just historian's gold from, from, from that standpoint. Um, there were torrential rains pouring down almost every day. No one could remember when he'd been dry, Eichelberger later wrote. The feet, arms, bellies, chests, armpits of my soldiers were hideous with jungle rot. Um, MacArthur's impatiently prodding him for victory, issuing communiques that make it seem like he's there too, which he wasn't. He never once visited. Um, but the good news was that by the second half of December, the Japanese were in even worse shape. Riven with disease, malnourished, isolated, dying in droves. They were hoping for reinforcement. Didn't come, partially because of Guadalcanal. Um, and they wrote about it in their diaries. What a discouraging and miserable state of affairs, Sergeant Kiyoshi Wada told his diary. Trees have fallen, limbs have been cracked, the hospital's in a horrible plight. What is going to happen to us? Another soldier sadly wrote, every day my comrades die one by one and our provisions disappear. Many penned uh, farewell letters to loved ones, though few of those, if any, got through. One wrote, I would like to write a few lines before I die. He wrote to his wife. You have a fine soul, one that is rare in this world, and by chance you married unworthy me and you devoted yourself faithfully to me. I will always be grateful. However, your devotion will have been in vain as I will soon die for our country. You're very stoic, as you could imagine. So bit by bit, Eichelberger's men gnawed away at this perimeter you see here. The fighting ends on January 3rd, 1943, with the complete annihilation of the Japanese garrison. The Americans buried hundreds upon hundreds of their bodies. Some are swollen yellow-green carcasses, Yank correspondent Dave Richardson wrote. Others are sun-bleached skeletons with tattered clothes covering their white bones. Uh, so Eichelberger had won the first American ground victory of World War II, and I think this is largely forgotten today, and I think that's unfortunate. Um, for a time, he gets publicity, but in MacArthur's theater, there was only room for one star, uh, one star publicity person. And so... Um, MacArthur will shelve him into a training command uh, until he needs him again later in the war and he'll use him heavily. He'll be really his most successful um, and vigorous and, and daring and aggressive operational commander. Uh, but he did, you know, Eichelberger found out later he'd been nominated for a Medal of Honor, but MacArthur had scotched that. Um, he found out later that uh, Eisenhower had wanted him for a major command in the Normandy invasion. MacArthur had scotched that. So um, Eichelberger will have resentment that builds up in the course of his life against MacArthur. Um, but he also got along pretty well with him and he admired some aspects of him too. So uh, in tandem with the Australian victories that are happening nearby Buna, um, then you see the beginning of this sort of Swapa MacArthur led drive all across New Guinea for almost the next year and a half or so. Uh, so basically, you inherit New Guinea here in this kind of, these kind of conditions, um, just one of the most remote and undeveloped places on planet Earth, teeming with disease, no infrastructure, um, crushing heat and humidity, overrun by jungles, mountains, swamps, practically look at the place and you've got malaria. Um, yet the Allies needed to, to control the North Coast in order to continue their advance, so you just had to move through it. Lieutenant General Brian Somerville, who was the commander of Army Service Forces, wrote, I think, very penetratingly, he said, the Army's really fighting two battles, one against the enemy, the other against the jungle. Average rainfall uh, was between 100 and 150 inches. Temperatures in the 90s, humidity in 90 percent. Um, one of the biggest problems, really the biggest problem is disease. So much so that I view the Pacific War uh, to some extent as an interspecies war. 
some 50%, 54% of hospital admissions were due to disease in New Guinea. In 1943, the army was losing uh, as many as five men to malaria for every one in combat against the Japanese. Um, fortunately, the disease usually wasn't fatal, but um, the Americans were losing 12,000 man days per month to malaria alone. Uh, when a soldier went down with malaria, on average, he spent 25 days in the hospital. Uh, plus, the disease usually recurred. Scrub typhus, too, begins to, spread, begins to spread through the ranks, and it had a 5% fatality rate. It was spread by little mites that were on, um, uh, on a lot of the grass, the tropical grass that the soldiers had to move through. By late 1943, 17 malaria control units uh, composed of like epidemiologists, entomologists, biologists uh, were starting to fight the malaria problem. Uh, and one of the ways they're going to do it is through insecticides, what were called bug bombs. You can imagine how healthy that was in 1943. Um, you know, so they've got that. Uh, and then they start to flame the mosquito breeding areas uh, with diesel oil. Uh, but it was impossible to eliminate all the mosquitoes. The real solution, of course, is pharmaceutical. Uh, medics ruthlessly enforced regular dosages of atabrine, uh, which only suppressed the symptoms of malaria, did not really cure it. Um, there were rumors that it would cause sterility. You can imagine then how that would spread through the ranks. Uh, that, that was untrue. What was true is that there was was, was called atabrine psychosis that would happen to maybe one, one or two people out of a thousand or so. Um, and what is almost universal is atabrine tended to create a yellowish tinge to the skin if you were a white person. Um, and so you could immediately tell someone who was a, a Pacific War veteran in that era by, by that kind of tinge to their skin. So life in New Guinea was hard and brutal, almost no amenities by American standards. Morale was usually very low. One battalion commander, I think, uh, quite insightfully wrote to his wife, there are only four things that'll keep soldiers happy, fighting, drinking, gambling, and women. And it's fair to say in New Guinea, none were available in anything like the quantities the soldiers would have desired. Uh, so soldiers ferment their own noxious jungle juice. Um, it's just this nasty mix of like fruit juice, raisins, potato peels, other detritus, uh, just packed together uh, and fermented and becomes this sort of 100 to 180 proof wallop. Um, in one fairly typical unit, about one third of the men were not only usually too drunk to go on guard duty, they were too drunk even to stand up, believe it or not. Uh, because of severe cultural taboos of uh, any fraternization with local women, uh, and whether white or black, most American GIs had, uh, had no interest in local women. Venereal disease rates were almost nil, whereas in Australia, uh, some units had about a one-third infection rate. Uh, but such was the, the sexual tension in theater uh, that medical unit commanders were, were, were assigning armed guards to their few female nurses wherever they went ostensibly to protect them from the Japanese, but in reality, as one officer admitted, quote, to discourage incidents of sexual harassment and fraternization. Um, there was a dark underbelly of depression, problem drinking, suicide, mental illnesses that festered among the troops. Um, neuropsychiatrists estimated that psychological problems, including psychosis and neurosis, uh, affected between five and 10% of the soldiers in New Guinea. In one very extreme case, Lieutenant Colonel Kenneth Kinsler, the commander of the 503rd Parachute Infantry Regiment, became so despondent that he committed suicide by shooting himself in the heart and went out while on a date with an Australian nurse. Well, athletics helped morale immensely. Uh, wherever the Americans developed their bases in New Guinea, they soon established leagues for baseball, softball, football, volleyball, even ping pong. Um, boxing matches were common too. Outdoor theaters afforded a hugely welcome diversion. Um, occasional interruptions by rain or by enemy air raids did nothing to dampen the enthusiasm for entertainment in the form of movies or live shows, live productions. Over a three month period at one typical base, soldiers at 43 different theaters took in 453 shows, just to give you a sense of, of how common this was. Um, and then you have this, you know, the, the logistics of it all. Um, you know, not always that sexy, but really, really important. Um, and that's a big part of what the Army is doing in the Pacific. Army logisticians, engineers, port battalions, quartermasters were veritable miracles to carve bases and ports out of the New Guinea wilderness. Uh, Allied armies on the island required 340,000 tons of materiel per month just to subsist. And once landed, uh, you know, as you see, this is landed stuff that's in a collecting point. 
the cargo degraded from the elements, from insects, from mold, from animals. Uh, so everything from blankets to medicine, uh, you know, had to be protected. It had to be moved. It had to be stored properly. By the end of 1943, engineers had constructed nearly three quarters of a million square feet of warehouse storage space, and there was still more on the way. Uh, so such previously barren places as Oro uh, Bay and Milne Bay now turned to th into thriving bases, almost like many American cities carved out of the New Guinea wilderness. Uh, the population of Oro Bay swelled to 50,000 GIs. The base now had 125 miles of road, eight operational runways, 35 bridges, multiple hospitals, and eight docks. Milne Bay was even bigger. By the end of 1943, it had 12 docks, 37 bridges, 130 culverts, 10 jetties, 20,000 feet of pipeline, plus scores of administration buildings. So MacArthur's theater in the course of the war received some 2.1 million measurement tons of material. Such a staggering quantity uh, that absorbs so much naval and merchant shipping uh, that they didn't have enough available for it. So the army then began to maintain its own fleet of barges and cargo vessels, of course, inevitably dubbed MacArthur's Navy. All right, so where does that leave us by the end of 1943? The split theaters, of course, um, Nimitz's theater here, the island hopping, Swapa, and then also, I should point out very briefly, um, you have a, an American military mission to China headed up by Lieutenant General Joseph Stilwell, what was called the China-Burma-India Theater, the idea being keep China in the war because you're tying down a lot of Japanese manpower. And, and I would hasten to say, you know, the, the Japanese had first um, pursued war on the Asian continent in China um, in the 1930s. And that's really when World War II begins, um, arguably in 1931, but certainly in 1937 in China. Uh, and then, of course, in 1941, they had chosen to go to war with the uh, European imperial powers in the United States. So in that sense, Japan had embraced a two-front war, just as Germany had in Europe, uh, by taking on the Soviet Union in addition to the Western powers. Uh, and so China tends to be viewed as a kind of tertiary theater, but I would almost argue to the forefront, it's quite the opposite, because um, if this Japanese manpower gets put into play elsewhere throughout the Pacific, uh, you are talking about a, a war of, of a massive bloodbath that's even way worse than, than what it was, um, not to mention the future for Asia and everything that has been meant uh, and, and the consequences of, of China becoming communist since. So, uh, so Joseph Stilwell has a big job there. Uh, and a major job, and it's you know so that's been going on since the uh, the end of 1941, and it'll go on throughout uh, to the fall of 1944 when he's finally sent home. Um, so, you know, Allies have now turned the tide of the war. By that point in time, the Japanese are increasingly on the defensive. By the end of 1943, um, uh, the, the Japanese are trying to hold on to this vast empire. And the balance of power, of course, now favors the allies, as do the economics and the industrial numbers. Um, so the army, the US Army has made a heck of a lot of mistakes. It still has plenty of deficiencies, uh, but it's maturing into a formidable force with effective leaders who have been tested under what I would say are the most challenging of circumstances. So in short, I believe it's fair to say the army had become characterized by its fire and fortitude. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. The, um, the thing we try to do is to, is to take the big picture that uh, John explained and then bring it into the, uh, the Minnesota involvement in this. Uh, Jim Opoloni is going to talk about the, uh, the, the tanks at Bataan. Again, Axel mentioned the, uh, the book by um, uh, Don uh, Caldwell which uh, mm -hmm. is a published record of this. But Jim, would you come up and tell us about the 192nd, 194th? Jim is from Illinois, retired teacher, and welcome to Minnesota. Go, go, uh, fast. <laughs> Carolina. All right, um, how I got involved in this, give you a little background, is one of the companies of the 192nd Tank Battalion came, out of the town in Illinois, the suburb of Chicago, that I taught in. And a lot of the members of the t tank company were former students of the high school. There were actually three units that made up the provisional tank unit. Um, there was the 17th Ordnance Company, which was created in August 41 
from one company, the one uh, um, the 19th Ordnance Company, or battalion, and they got orders right away to go to San Francisco. In fact, the 194 tanks came west with 17th Ordnance. Okay, the 192nd was made up of National Guardsmen from Wisconsin, Illinois, Ohio, and Kentucky. And sometime between when the 192nd was federalized, I can't talk, in November and the 194th in February, they changed the structure of battalions from four companies to three. And so the 194th only had three companies. It had A from Brainerd, B from St. Joseph, Missouri, and C from Salinas, California. And its D company was from Washington State, but was never federalized. All right, this is a picture of A company right before it left uh, Brainerd for Fort Lewis. This is its barracks at Fort Lewis. The reality was the fort had no facilities for tanks. Everything had to be built for the battalion after it got there. Um, when they got there, the, the reason they had, been, they had been put off to February was there was a strike, so their barracks weren't completed, and because of the climate, they didn't want the guys living in tent, tents. And when they got there, most of the men came down with colds. They actually put a lot of them in the hospital to stop the spread of the colds. So when, after they began getting the infrastructure, another thing happened is over half the battalion ended up at Fort Knox, Kentucky because all the facilities were at Fort Knox. So they were in radio school, tank mechanic school, and other schools being trained to do their jobs. The guys left behind at Fort Lewis actually collected garbage and distributed coal, and they trained on weekends from you know, everything I was able to find. Now, where did their tanks come? Probably out of a lot of junkyards because that seemed to be the, they got whatever the army had discarded. And if you looked at the tanks in this picture, a lot of them have cavalry insignias on them, which means they came from cavalry units. And this is just a picture of a 194th tank going up a bank of a river, or Clover, Clover Creek at Fort Lewis. Ernest Miller, okay, Ernest Miller and and James Weaver, the commander of the tank group, did not like each other. We, uh, Miller would badmouth Weaver, Weaver would badmouth Miller. It was so petty that when, after the war, when Weaver actually visited the towns, he went from every tank company town to the next, he skipped Brainerd. You know, that's how petty it was. So, um, and Weaver actually said about Miller, he said he was courageous, he, uh, he was a strong leader, but he had a big ego. And he made decisions that he should not make. This is a tank of the 194th being unloaded in Manila. It's maybe the same tank on the, on the Pier 7 at Manila. The reason the, the turret had been removed was the hold of the ship was not tall enough, so they had to remove them. And what they did, to reattach them to the correct tank is they painted the serial number of the tank on the turret. And this was actually taken December 1st, 41 at Clark Field. This is actually a C Company 194th tank. And this is just a picture of Clark Field. This is actually A Company, an A Company tank. Glenn Nelson is in this picture, I believe. And uh, he actually shipped out, I, he shipped out very shortly before the attack back to the States to go to OCS. But they had predetermined positions. Half the airfield was covered by the 194th, the north end. The south end was covered by the 192nd. And because when they went to the Philippines, B Company of the 194th got sent to Alaska, D Company of the 192nd was supposed to be transferred to the 194th they started the paperwork. It was never completed. In fact, I have a document from the U.S. Army that said it was just suspended. They remained part of the 192nd. This is a tank, a 194th A Company tank 
in his position around Clark Field. One of the interesting factors is they were pretty much out in the open, the tanks. The Japanese did not attack them during the attack. They, um, a few planes did. The bombs dropped either in front of them or between the tanks, but they pretty much left the tanks alone. This is a picture of Clark Field being bombed by the Japanese. Another picture of Clark after the attack. I just this is a B-17 at Clark Field. A hangar. Now Robert Brooks was the he was in D Company. He was killed at Clark Field. He was first member of an armored division or unit killed during World War II. The main parade ground at Fort Knox, Kentucky, is named after him. When what they discovered, um, General Deaver, the commanding officer at Fort Knox, sent his staff officer to find out any information about Brooks they could, they found out he was African American. He had blonde hair, blue eyes. He, I guess they asked him and he let him believe he was white. All right? And he went over with the 192nd to the Philippines. Now, the Japanese landed in multiple places. Um, on December 21st, <clears throat> a company of the 192nd was ordered to Lungang Gulf to engage the Japanese because of logistics that went from a company to one tank platoon of ta five tanks. The other, the 194th had been set, set off to the northeast one company of the 194th was sent down to southern Luzon. But what happened is that that one tank platoon pretty much got annihilated. Four of the tanks actually were recovered and repaired, but one crew became POWs on December 22nd. The, other, the rest of the battalions, when they got their logistics together, ended up at Lengang Golf. They were on a ridge overlooking the Japanese landings, and they wanted to open up on the Japanese and they actually requested permission to fire on them, and they were ordered to withdraw. And that was partially because the Japanese had cru heavy cruisers in that bay, and they wanted to save the tanks. Now, this is a 194th tank, if you've ever seen this picture before. Can't tell you what company. And the reason I know that is, and Doug knows this too, the reason is on the left side of that picture of the tank, the one machine gun has been removed. That was done because they did not have the correct radio, and the one they found that would fit into the tank, they had to remove a machine gun. So they played it over the port for the machine gun, and if you see pictures, you can tell which battalion it is by whether or not they have two machine guns or one. This is actually a 192nd half track, real, okay. Every guy, I can name every guy sitting in that half track that's visible, every one of them died as POWs. This is, there are very few pictures of the tanks on Bataan. We got these from members of B Company 192nd. A guy sent the film home undeveloped when a sub, they were told a sub was coming in. If you got any mail you want to send home, send it home. So we have a number of pictures of the tanks on Bataan, but they're all 192nd. They're the only known pictures. Um, the SPMs, self-propelled mounts, they, Weaver used those like medium tanks because of the guns. Anything with tracks were assigned to the tank group. We came to that realization. And they were manned by Filipino armies. The sergeant was Filipino scouts. The driver was from the tank group. They, they took the drivers out of the tanks, and then they had to find other guys to drive the tanks. And the tankers did not like having these things near them, their tanks, because they drew heavy artillery fire on them. This is actually the surrender. What happened is <clears throat> Edward King realized on April 3rd, the Japanese launched a major offense. For March, the battle was at a standstill. Nothing was happening. The Japanese were as sick as the Americans. They brought in troops from Singapore, and on April 3rd, they launched an all-out attack against the defenders. They broke through 
came over the east side of Mount Samat, and we had tankers telling us we'd fight, ourselves, fight our way out of one pocket and found ourselves in a bigger pocket. And what happened is King realized, the reality was, and these, this is what King said, he said, he came to, you know, he, he sat down and thought about it. He had 40,000 Filipino civilians that he feared was going to, going to be massacred. He had over 10,000 troops in the hospital. One quarter of his troops, only one quarter of his troops, were healthy enough to fight. And then he had two days, and there where they were on quarter rations, he had two days of food left. So he made this decision to negotiate surrender, their surrender of Bataan. Uh, the guy sitting in the Jeep is a guy named Bill Burns, the driver. He attended the high school I taught at. The flag, white flag, was actually betting from A Company 192nd out of Janesville, Wisconsin. One guy, Phil Parrish, found it. They were looking for some white, something white to use as flags. So the, the officers in the Jeep said the drivers driving to the surrender, you could hear their teeth chattering because you know they were so afraid. And they were being strafed by Japanese planes, even flying the flags. When, um, when word came back to King, he went, he went to negotiate the surrender. He went through a section of the area still held by B Company of the 192nd 17th Ordinance. And King told those guys, he says, don't, don't let anyone ever tell you you surrendered. OK, I surrendered you. And on that note, he went and negotiated the surrender. And at, during the surrender talks at the very end, when basically the Japanese say either surrender or would just attack again, the um, homeless chief of staff said, the, Japan, the Imperial Japanese Army are not barbarians, which I think we found out otherwise. And um, a lot of the men did try to escape to Corregidor, a good number did. They ended up assigned to the 4th Marines and actually got honorary member certificates. And, and that's where I'm going to stop because being doing the PLW thing is a whole other story. I, I was very glad to have Adrian Martin uh, come. The um, Adrian <clears throat> Uh, has written two books, which, which you see here. Uh, one is The Brothers of Bataan, which is about, um, uh, features an uncle of his, and Adrian is actually named after the uncle who died as a part of a POW. But Adrian uh, and his uh, uh, co-author on another book called Operation Plum about eight years ago, I think it was, we, we did a book on Operation Plum, and of course, Adrian had his brothers from Matan. Uh, Adrian is um, from Wisconsin. God, we got Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota. How did that work out tonight, huh? But um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very proud to have you, Adri Adrian. Would you come up? Uh, and um, we, we, we've, we've got Adrian. Uh, scheduled to speak to a round table that we're trying to support. If any of you are in Tucson this winter, Adrian will be speaking to the World War round table in Tucson. So Adrian, welcome back to Minnesota, buddy. Thank you. Thank you for the second nice reception this evening. Uh, I'm a retired high school and college football official, and I'm not used to getting nice receptions. <laughs> Brothers from Bataan, as Don mentioned, is about my uncle, who will die as a prisoner of war. Um, the book is about his life in prison camps, both in the Philippines and in Japan. He was a college graduate from St. Norbert's College in uh, De Pere, Wisconsin. He spent uh, a couple semesters uh, in law school down at Madison. He spent a year at Notre Dame doing graduate work. 
but the depression was on. There weren't any jobs. He will end up being in the New Mexico National Guard. The New Mexico National Guard, for many decades, were soldiers on horseback. And prior to the war in the uh, late 1930s, they become anti-aircraft. And of course, you're going to wonder, how does a guy from Wisconsin get into the New Mexico National Guard, the 200th Coast Artillery? When we started the draft, uh, a lot of my uncle's college and high school friends were called up on that first draft, and he decided to join them. And they get on a train in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and they stop at Fond du Lac and pick up a bunch of guys from that part of Wisconsin, get to Camp Grant, and they're uh, joined by a bunch of uh, recruits from northern Illinois, and they sent, are sent to Camp Wallace down in Texas after basic training, they get shipped over to Fort Bliss in Texas where there are four outfits uh, trying to get up to wartime strength. So they took a bunch of these guys from Wisconsin and Illinois and put them in the New Mexico National Guard. Probably about 30, 40 guys from uh, Wisconsin and Illinois are in the New Mexico National Guard. They leave on the uh, President Coolidge for the Philippines in, on September 9th with the 194th tankers. Now, you got guys who are 18 to 22 years old on a ship for two and a half weeks on the way to the Philippines. And of course, young guys like that are interested in two things. Number one, the few women on board all start to look like they're movie stars. And secondly, they're hungry all the time. And all of a sudden, arguments break out as to who's going to be first in line. So they decided, the mess people decided, we're going to have a boxing match. And the 200th Coast Artillery entered Bob uh, Rutledge from Clovis, New Mexico. They'd gone to the finals of the National Golden Gloves. And I'm not sure who the 194th entered, but I can tell you for the rest of the trip, the 200th Coast Artillery was first in line for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They arrived in Manila on S September 26th and headed up to Fort Stotzenberg, which was right next to Clark Field. And the 200th guys will tell you that uh, their equipment, their anti-aircraft guns were from World War I, and the shells went up to 17,000 feet. And the Japanese knew that, and they flew over with their bombers over Clark Field at 20,000 feet. Now, Operation Plum is about the, the 27th bomb group. And they get sent to the Philippines with their dive bombers, 1,400 pilots, mechanics, and two support groups. One of the main characters in Operation Plum is a Glenwood Stevenson, also from Wisconsin, who around 1934 leaves Wisconsin uh, as a hobo on a train, works in the state of Washington and down in California, can't find anything permanent. So he signs up for the 31st Infantry and gets sent to the Philippines in 1935. And the officers there are really impressed with how sharp this guy is. So they sent him to the West Point Prep School over in uh, the Philippines. And he gets an appointment to West Point in 1936. He graduates from West Point in 1940 and becomes a pilot and becomes part of the 27th Bomb Group. Now, when the Coolidge dropped off the 200th and the tankers, they brought civilians back. And now, they're ready to take the 27th Bomb Group over to the Philippines. And along the way at Hawaii, they meet up with the uh, Scott, which is taking the 192nd tankers, and they're in a convoy and they arrive in the Philippines in uh, November 21st. And you know the attack on Clark Field is about two and a half weeks later. Unfortunately, for the 27th Bomb Group, all their dive bombers are 10,000 miles out on the Pacific in another convoy. So what do you do? MacArthur gave them guns. 
said, you guys are now part of my infantry. Pilots, highly trained technicians, 1,400 of them, they don't know how to handle a gun. One of the guys said, a goat knows more about how to ride a bicycle than we do how to fire a gun. Well, what are you going to do with these, this convoy with the uh, dive bombers? It gets sent to Australia. So uh, early on, 22 pilots sneak out of the Philippines by small airplane and submarine to get to Brisbane to start putting their, the dive bombers together. And once they do, they're stuck in Australia because all the refueling stops going back to the Philippines are now in enemy hands. The story, Operation Plum, goes in two directions. What happens to all those guys, pilots and technicians, why they become POWs? And then the other part of the story is, what do these 22 pilots do with dive bombers that are basically worthless down in Australia? Well, those of you who were at the Operation Plum program uh, seven or eight years ago know that these guys saw 15 brand new B-25s at an airfield not being used. They had been consigned to the Dutch who had just bowed out of the war. So they went down and stole them. Now, in the ensuing days after that, the Dutch government and the United States said, oh yeah, we agreed to it. Those of you who are at the program, uh, Operation Plum, you know that we had Howard West, who is the last of the pilots who will go on the famous Royce's Raid, which I'll talk about in a second. And Howard was there in his uniform and his medals. He lived out in Excelsior on Lake Minnetonka. He's now deceased. But I asked Howard, I said, did you guys really steal those B-25s from the Dutch? And if you recall, he paused for about three seconds and had a big smile on his face and he said, you damn right we stole them. MacArthur was in Australia. They needed an Air Force. Now, one of the interesting things about dealing with POWs, there are some POWs in both books. One book, I was interested in what camps they were in. The second book, I was interested in them as they were members of the 27th. When my uncle died uh, in Hanawa, Japan, which is hundreds of miles north of, uh, of Tokyo, uh, he was working in a copper mine that was owned by Mitsubishi. And in recent years, uh, lawyers in California were preparing a lawsuit against Mitsubishi for slave labor. And they contacted me and they took all of my research, all my documents. I had a number of things from the mine and so on. Unfortunately, there was a treaty that we signed in 1952 uh, that prohibited uh, uh, us getting uh, money for the, those who participate in slave labor. But that could be a story for a, a, another program about that lawsuit. Uh, thank you very much. Doug Thompson is the curator of the uh, military museum up at Camp Ripley. And uh, the picture you see on the screen now Doug, tell us about this picture, how you acquired it, and uh, its significance. Sure. Um, we got this photo at the Minnesota Military Museum a few years ago from the uh, estate of a uh, soldier that fought in the Philippines in 1944 and 45, and he took it from the effects of a captured or, or, or dead Japanese soldier. And it's kind of unique in um, uh, the photos that we've, we, we've seen here, and that it's a... Um, Japanese soldiers obviously celebrating victory over a tank. And Jim, we determined that that's a 194th tank. It was captured in the Philippines. Um, it's just kind of a great image. It, it, it came into the museum um, in a, about a one by two inch format, very small photograph. Uh, we scanned it, blew it up, and it's um, kind of a neat image. I don't think it's ever been published before or ever seen. Um, the neat thing is, I have a contact over in the Philippines that I sent this photograph to, and uh, he said I knew where the photograph was taken. So he went to this location where this 
where this Japanese uh, soldiers were celebrating on this tank and took a then and now photograph of uh, the location today. Uh, there's Mount Samat in the background. Can we go to the next one here? Um, so yeah, the more things change, the more they stay the same. So it's kind of neat that uh, he was able to find this location for this photograph. And in the, in the, in the ditch off of the road. Yeah, so um, there's my friend's motorcycle. He went off into the jungle, off into the ditch in the right there, and actually found uh, tank cracks from an, from an M3 Stewart tank. Uh, we think it's probably from that tank. Um, it's a, 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 a Batan, Batan historic, historian that was, was there. Um, I've begged, I've pleaded with them to get some links from that tank track to put on our museum, but um, no go so far. So still negotiating with them. Well, it is. It'd be a great addition. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, yeah. Doug. Okay, let's go to Q and A. Uh, this is a question for uh, Mr. McManus. Um, I know that the Army also participated in the Guadalcanal campaign and possibly other things in the, in the Solomon Islands. Could you maybe give some detail on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, I'm glad you mentioned that because um, Guadalcanal is, really typifies a lot of the battles in the Pacific theater and ever since. There are very, very few exclusively marine battles like Tarawa. Guadalcanal begins as, the, as a marine battle when the 1st Marine Division lands there on August 7, 1942, and then elements of the 2nd Marine Division. But within about uh, four weeks or so, you're going to have the Americal Division there and they eventually the 25th Division. Um, the, by the time the fighting concludes in February 1943, the majority of the combat manpower is actually Army. And the Army ends up doing a, you know, a tremendous amount of the fighting at Guadalcanal, of course. The 25th Division commander is the famous J. Lawton Collins, who will end up as a corps commander in Europe, uh, leading troops on the Utah Beach on D-Day. Uh, Alexander Patch was a, a um, was the ground commander there by the end of the Battle of Guadalcanal, and uh, I have a lot about him actually. His his letters home to his wife are fascinating, and he's writing about a lot of his emotions as he's leading um, the the American side in some of the climactic fighting, like December 1942, January, uh, February 1943, he ends up as a very successful commander, becomes seventh army commander in Europe. So yeah, from Guadalcanal forward, you're starting to see kind of stepping stone um, army and somewhat Marine Corps operations in the Solomon. So what follows on from that is the New Georgia campaign in uh, 1943, like July 1943 and thereafter, which is vast majority Army and also some Marine Corps uh, recon units too. And then uh, maybe a little bit better known is the Bougainville operation, which the 3rd Marine Division lands in November 1943. Uh, but you have Army units that then come in and hold this perimeter. And there was actually ferocious fighting on Bougainville as the Japanese tried to snuff out that perimeter in March 1944. So. Um, all of this was meant in the sort of larger context to isolate and, uh, and envelop Rabaul on uh, the big island of New Britain with MacArthur's forces in New Guinea and then these other army and marine forces coming up through the Solomons. And they were thinking by 1943 they would have to invade Rabaul and neutralize that massive base. But ultimately, of course, um, the Allies decide that they're going to bypass it and, and uh, the, the war moves on from Rabaul. So, but from the beginning, you definitely see a, a major army presence in the South Pacific. Hi, hi uh, Brooks Berg, uh, former Navy submariner. Um, but I do, uh, I've done some reading on MacArthur and, uh, and the submarine force and everything like that. Uh, in the South Pacific and Central Pacific, it seemed like a Navy show and they were very parochial about it for whatever reason. But don't you think in the Southwest Pacific, it was the first display of actually joint thinking? You know, you, ha you had the Army, you had the, the I guess, C-47s uh, ferrying the troops, and then you had PT boats that were interdicting the uh, Japanese supply train. So, John, can you comment on uh, the purple nature of the command structure that MacArthur or somebody developed, and it worked really well? Yeah, I'd love to. Great point. Uh, first of all, thanks for your service as a dolphin sailor. Um, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I would say it's not the first example. We could go back, like, say, to the Mexican-American War, in which there, General Winfield Scott 
uh, does some pretty amazing work uh, alongside the Navy for the Veracruz invasion and all that. But um, in World War II, uh, the, you definitely see a kind of exercise in jointness that comes out of MacArthur's command. And what's interesting about it is this, is that MacArthur, when he left the Philippines, um, left with a really bad attitude about the Navy and the Army Air Forces uh, because he felt that the Navy had betrayed him, uh, Admiral Tommy Hart, um, and his fleet had had not much impact on the battle and, and a lot of the ships had left. And so MacArthur fairly or unfairly felt that. And he, and he felt that the, the Air Force commanders had not done well either. And he was like, well, I, these guys, I, I don't know what I'm going to do with them. But um, several people begin to turn him around on this. Admiral William Halsey, whom he has a very good relationship with it early on. Um, he has a very productive working relationship with him. And of course, George Kenny, who I'd mentioned tonight, uh, so you see the beginnings of this kind of inner service jointness there with the possible exception of the Marines. He, he only briefly has Marines under his command. Most of his ground forces from there forward are going to be uh, army soldiers or they're going to be Australians. Um, but also, you know, there's an international character to it as well because he's got Australian naval forces, Australian air forces, and obviously the ground forces too. So it's really quite a, um, you know, it really looks ahead in, in terms of the, the kind of sophisticated setup, um, the, the productive relationships. Another one I hadn't mentioned is Vice Admiral Thomas Kincaid, um, who MacArthur works very closely with throughout much of the war. Um, Admiral uh, Daniel Barbie, um, who becomes one of the leading experts on amphibious operations and will work with MacArthur for much of the rest of the war over many, many different invasions. Uh, so I, I think the point you make is, is just a really insightful, excellent point. Um, SWAPA becomes a, a kind of joint exercise that I think we can learn from quite a bit today. Okay, let's, uh, let's close it up now. In two weeks, we have the, uh, a look at the mistakes that, the, that Hitler made in uh, losing the war. Uh, many, but uh, Andy wow. Nagorski uh -huh. is one of the great uh, historians on that topic. Uh, and then that'll be the second program this month, uh, two weeks from tonight. And then our November program is on um, Beetle Smith. That'll be the Harold Deutsch lecture. And uh, uh, we look forward to having you. I, I want to thank John for working with us on this Zoom. I want to thank Jim for coming up from Illinois and Adrian for coming over from Wisconsin, over to Minnesota. Thank you all. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn dash ww2 roundtable dot org